Hi again. In the last two episodes, we were dealing with Walter Martin's Cults Reference Bible Assessment of the Watchtower History, and he's already dealt with the, the era of C.T. Russell and J.F. Rutherford. Now he's talking about the ascendancy of Nathan Knorr. The modern era of the Jehovah's Witnesses began with the ascendancy of Nathan Homer Knorr, 1905 to 1977, to the presidency upon the demise of Rutherford in 1942. Knorr actually ran the Brooklyn office the last few years of Rutherford's life. Through writing Watchtower materials, speaking on behalf of the society, and utilizing his administrative gifts, Knorr had firmly established himself as, the, as a prime leader and likely candidate to succeed Rutherford. Knorr's approach to the presidency differed considerably from both Russell and Rutherford, in that while they capitalized upon the power of their personalities to propel the movement along, Nor preferred an almost faceless presidency in which the organization, as God's channel of truth in the last days, received the full focus. Beginning with Nor, all Watchtower literature has been written anonymously. That's a very interesting contrast with the, well, the personality cult that essentially was Russellism and Rutherford's very dominant personality. Nor was an invisible president, indeed. Following in the footsteps of Rutherford, Nathan Nor was responsible for unprecedented growth and a continued improvement in organizational effectiveness. Nor's presidency also was characterized by an emphasis on training. In 1943, he founded the Watchtower Bible School of Gilead and the Theocratic Ministry School. The Gilead School, located in Brooklyn, provides a 10-month training course for leaders, both at home and on the mission field. The ministry school, conducted by local congregations, trains individual witnesses in presenting and debating doctrine. More recently, NOAA established training courses for congregation elders, branch personnel, and pioneers, those engaged in full-time or nearly full-time work. Keeping in mind this is all written and published by 1981, so really Martin, when he assesses the history of the Watchtower, is basically talking about the first three presidents. Martin died even before Fred Franz, so he only saw about uh, 12 years, 15 years at the most, of Fred Franz's ascendancy. Nor and Frederick W. Franz headed a translation committee of seven men, whom the society has attempted to keep anonymous, that in 1951 produced the New World Translation of the Christian Greek Scriptures. The Old Testament, or Hebrew Scriptures as the society prefers to call them, was translated in the late 1950s, while the complete New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures was published in 1961. The New World Translation, in many places, translates the Greek in a way that lends unusual support to the Watchtower's peculiar doctrines, and thus proves a useful tool for the society's purposes but not without having engendered severe criticism from many circles of Greek scholarship. The translation is discredited not only as being wooden and awkward, but as a deliberate attempt to twist certain passages out of their contextual meaning. In many ways, Nor's presidency modified the public appearance and presentation of the New World Society, as the cult came to be known under his leadership. Modern kingdom halls have become visible reminders of the witnesses' presence in every community, serving as a center for the local congregations. Unlike the days of Rutherford, witnesses are now more tactful about those outside their movement, although their beliefs concerning them have not essentially changed. Even the term religion has become acceptable in the sense of true or pure religion. The last major change of Nor's presidency was the establishing of an enlarged governing body, located at the Brooklyn headquarters. In 1976, administrative responsibilities were divided up and assigned out to various committees made up of members of the governing body. Its 18 current members have each been devoting their full time to the witnessing work for 35 years or more. That's a direct quote from Philip Elliott's Jehovah's Witnesses in the 1st and 20th centuries. Frederick W. Franz, 1893, onward, succeeded Nor to the presidency in 1977. Franz has long been considered by many as the Watchtower's chief theologian. 
And now Martin goes to major deviations from orthodox doctrine. A major thrust in Watchtower propaganda is that the doctrine of the Trinity is not biblical at all, but has its roots in paganism, or Babylon, as the witnesses like to refer to it. For them, the Father, Jehovah, alone, is God. His first and greatest creation was the Word, or Michael the Archangel, who gave up his angelic nature when he was begotten of the Virgin Mary as Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit, or Holy Spirit, as they prefer it, is neither God nor a person, but Jehovah's invisible act of force which accomplishes his will. The Watchtower teaches that after Christ died on the torture stake, to them the cross is a Babylonian concept, he arose a glorious, invisible spirit creature. Thus they deny that he rose bodily from the grave, and correspondingly they deny the visible, physical return of Christ to the earth. In fact, they teach that he already returned in 1914 and has been invisibly ruling through the Watchtower Society ever since. Therefore, the great hope of the witnesses is not the return of Christ, but the battle of Armageddon, when the heavenly forces will destroy Earth's present kingdom, which includes everyone but the witnesses, and the millennial reign of Christ will begin. The society denies that salvation is strictly by grace, instead of instead teaching that Christ's ransom merely made it possible for men to work for their own salvation. Among the things necessary to obtain salvation are faith, good works, Bible study, association with the Watchtower, and witnessing. The orthodox doctrine of the total depravity of human nature is not grasped by Jehovah's Witnesses. Thus, they do not appreciate the need for every man, of every man, to be regenerated or born again in order to be in right relationship with God. In Watchtower theology, only the 144,000 who have heavenly hope need to be born again. The great multitude who will dwell on a paradise earth do not need this experience. The foundational Watchtower denial of eternal punishment for the wicked, they believe that they will be annihilated instead, is closely related to their denial that the soul is eternal by nature. They insist that man does not have a soul as part of his composite being, but is a soul. Thus, when he dies, he has no consciousness. All that is left is his physical remains. Resurrection involves recreating of an individual who has become non-existent. And here I would say Martin doesn't speak for all Christians, and that many Christians do not believe that the soul is inherently immortal. They believe the spirit was created by God, which is not quite the same thing. So Martin doesn't speak for even all evangelicals in this insistence that the soul is inherently immortal. There is range for disagreement and uh, ability to dis disagree without punishment in Christendom for these deviations from what he calls orthodox doctrine. This section is entitled Distinctive Features. Jehovah's Witnesses are conscientious objectors to any military involvement. This position is not taken because of a deep-rooted pacifism, but because they do not consider themselves members of any earthly kingdom and thus do not identify with the causes of the nations in which they live. The United States has been fairly tolerant of this, but this did not come without a struggle on the Witnesses' part. In May 1918, Judge Rutherford and eight other Watchtower officials were imprisoned for nine months on charges of obstructing the draft. The charges were later dropped. Another belief of Jehovah's Witnesses, which adds to their reputation for being unpatriotic, is their refusal to salute the flag. The Watchtower teaches that saluting a nation's flag is equal to ascribing salvation to it, and thus it is idolatrous. In 1943, the Witnesses obtained a ruling from the United States Supreme Court that citizens have a right to refuse to salute the flag. In secular society, the most controversial of Jehovah's Witnesses' doctrines is their belief that blood transfusions are a violation of scriptural injunctions against eating blood. As a result, any Jehovah's Witness who receives a blood transfusion is considered in danger of eternal damnation. A number have refused transfusions at the cost of their own lives. In individual cases involving children, the courts have generally ruled that the Witnesses do not have the right to deny their children life because of religious convictions. Now he has a section 
present-day Jehovah's Witnesses. Brooklyn, New York has been the headquarters of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society since 1909. The characteristic zeal of the Witnesses is evident by the 2,400 employees of the Society in Brooklyn who are willing to receive only $20 monthly income in addition to room and board for the privilege of working at the earthly headquarters of God's organization. In Brooklyn, the Watchtower owns its own self-sufficient printing plant, which includes six buildings manned by 1,800 workers. An additional 600 workers live at the Society's farm and factory in Wallkill, New York, which produces food for the Brooklyn and Wallkill employees. It is in Brooklyn that the Watchtower and Awake magazines are printed. The Watchtower, which concerns itself primarily with doctrine, is published in 106 languages, with an average printing of 8.9 million. Awake examines world's events and human life in general from the standpoint of Watchtower theology. An average of 7.8 million copies of Awake are published in 34 languages. Again, these stats are all 40 years old now. After a period of indoctrination, one officially becomes a Jehovah's Witness through baptism by immersion. Some 113,779 converts were baptized in 1980. Each member is expected to give public testimony to his faith, usually through distributing literature, either from door to door or on street corners. For this, witnesses are given quotas, and areas are divided systematically so that each home is visited. Jehovah's Witnesses are composed of a comparatively low number of college graduates, and the average income of the Witnesses falls below the American mean. One explanation for this is that the Watchtower's condemnation of the rest of society quite naturally appeals to the socially alienated. Witnesses meet several times weekly for book studies and talks which consist of indoctrination into Watchtower theology and training in proselytizing. International assemblies are an important feature in the religious life of Jehovah's Witnesses. In 1978, 100 assemblies were held in some 45 countries. Also significant is the Lord's Memorial Service, observed once a year at Passover. Only those who consider themselves members of the 144,000 partake of the communion bread and wine, as they alone are considered to be members of the body of Christ. In 1980, over 5.7 million were present for the service held around the world, yet only 9,564 partook of the sacraments. Well, all these stats are, well, some of, like the number of partakers obviously has grown enormously in the, in the 40 years since these words were penned. On the other hand, their distribution of literature has di diminished drastically. I'm putting in a link to the first of a playlist entitled, Have Jehovah's Witnesses Ever Been God's Organization? And I'll also put a link to that playlist on your screen. See you soon.